Good afternoon. I'm Ellen Siegel, Chair of Friends of Cancer Research. Welcome to day two of our virtual real world evidence meeting. I welcome all of you. Thank you for participating. Thank you for your work. We're all incredibly excited about this work. You heard results yesterday. Now we're going to be move, moving forward. A special thank you to the entire team at Friends who have worked relentlessly on this project on behalf of patients. And now I will lead you to our president, Jeff Allen. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Allen. Uh, and thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. I'm Jeff Allen, president and CEO of Friends of Cancer Research. Uh, during the first day of the Friends of Cancer Research virtual meeting of an international framework for real world evidence, we saw the presentation of results from a number of our different collaborative efforts that have been underway. For those of you that were not able to join yesterday's meeting, I'd like to just spend a couple of minutes uh, providing a very brief recap. What we saw from all of the participating collaborators yesterday was that an impressive depth of data was able to be analyzed from numerous different real world oncology data organizations. We found that it was possible to identify similar directionality and treatment effect of immuno-oncology agents using real world evidence that has, was consistent with recent clinical trials. The groups that were participating in this also showed the ability to demonstrate correlation between real world overall survival and other real world endpoints, such as time to treatment discontinuation and time to next treatment. Performing these analyses across 10 independent data sets indicates that these observations and the effect of these real world endpoints are not a unique attribute to any individual data set. In addition, we saw that this framework was able to be expanded from advanced non-small cell lung cancer uh, to be able to pr provide similar results in melanoma with few considerations for the underlying condition. And finally, all of this work together supports the further development and expansion of the framework for future studies. I'd like to thank all of our collaborators in developing these analyses listed here today on the slide. And now for today's session, as we discuss more about how this analysis may inform future drug development programs and regulatory decision making, I'd like to introduce our panelists for today's keynote conversation. Dr. Amy Abernethy is the Principal Deputy Commissioner of the US Food and Drug Administration. And Dr. Michelle McMurray Heath is the President and CEO of the Biotechnology Innovation Organization, or BIO. Amy, Michelle, thanks so much for joining us. I'll turn things over to Michelle. Hello. It is such a pleasure to be with you. And I've got to say, I'm so excited to have this conversation with Amy today. We had a warm up the other day and it was fantastic. So Amy, you all set? I'm ready and thank you, Michelle. I'm so excited to talk to you. All right, well, let's get started. So the COVID-19 pandemic has forced more widespread adoption of digital technology and medicine from using telemedicine for routine care to clinical trials. Are any of these changes here to stay? And I gotta say, our member companies are dying to know the answer to this question as well. So, you know, COVID-19 has been complex in all of our lives and that's the understatement. But perhaps there's some silver linings here. And one of them is that this experiment of how we manage ourselves, how we conduct our clinical trials, how do we really do the research and clinical development in the context of COVID-19 COVID-19 has forced us to get comfortable with and learn about how these technologies, remote monitoring, telemedicine, the ability to use real world data to fill in clinical trial data sets, how they perform in action. And I anticipate that the answer to your question, are they here to stay, is some are yes, and some will need to be right-sized. So practically speaking, um, the FDA has put forward through guidance in, in the past, for example, the ability to potentially use remote monitoring in appropriate circumstances as a way of evaluating patients in the context of clinical trials. However, within COVID-19, remote monitoring became a demand because otherwise patients could not come to the clinic and yet we needed to be able to evaluate them for safety and also performance of the medical product. And now what we can do is step back and be able to look at how did the process of remote monitoring impact the safety monitoring of the patient in the clinical trial, as well as the integrity of the overall clinical trial data. 
That's just one example. And I think that there have been a number of digital technologies put into play that we'll be able to understand better. So everything from biosensors and home pulse ox monitoring to ultimately the incorporation of real world data. But I submit to you, we have as a clinical trial community, as a real world data community, a huge task to do. And that's to have the discipline as the pandemic ends to step back and study in detail the impact of each of these technologies and understand how can we use them safely, what happens to the integrity of the data set, and when do they perform as they expect, and when do we need to edit how we incorporate them into our clinical trial design. Hmm. So any early lessons learned as you look across the clinical trial landscape from your unique vantage point? Um, so I think that some of the early lessons learned is that you know, practically speaking, for many of these technologies to go forward, we need three things. We need the sponsors who design and actually pay for and execute the trials to be willing to incorporate these technologies. We need regulators to be willing to have the confidence to review data sets and also to be able to provide feedback of what does and does not work. And we actually need sites and patients to make sure that this fits into the way that they conduct clinical trials and they actually know how to use the technologies. So I think one of the, my lessons learned and sort of uh, kind of main pieces of um, advice actually through this is the familiarity with those and the familiarity that all three actors start to gain that allows sponsors to be more comfortable, that allows the FDA and other regulators around the world to say, okay, I understand how this is gonna perform and actually allows also site investigators and patients, patient participants to figure out how to do this. Mm -hmm. So FDA has utilized its regulatory flexibility quite a bit during the pandemic to support continued drug development. What's the agency doing to leverage the data collected during this phase of increased regulatory flexibility to support these permanent changes? You know. How are we starting to do those disciplined studies of how to improve the system overall that you, that you referenced in your opening? So at the agency, um, we have embarked upon a disciplined action to top, stop and take stock of what we're learning. And um, this is trans agency. So it's not just about clinical trial conduct or, or data sets, but it's actually really across all the activities in the pandemic what do we see now? What does this tell us that we need to do um, further in the pandemic? And also, what does this tell us about what we need to do um, beyond the pandemic? And we're calling it the Pandemic Preparedness um, uh, and Recovery Program PREP is um, sort of <laughs> the, the acronym. And, and really, the intention is to really understand how did, for example, our regulatory flexibility perform and what did we learn about what we need to do now and differently in the future? And, and how are we going to um, kind of continuously improve and improve our capacity for the future? So we actually have a specific book of work focused on this activity. So many folks are excited about the COVID-19 evidence accelerator and earlier this month, we at BIO, um, our Real World Evidence Task Force, met with Susan Winkler and other leadership from Reagan Udall to discuss it. How are these learnings impacting the regulatory decision-making opportunities for um, some of our BIO members to be involved? You've been very involved with the COVID-19 Evidence Accelerator, and that's been led by Friends of Cancer Research and Reagan Udall Foundation for FDA. Can you talk about why this effort is so important? Well, I lost you just as you were asking the question, but I think I know where you're going. <laughs> and because this is one I was really excited to answer, I'm going to just jump right in. Um, the evidence accelerator. So, so um, let me sort of step back and talk a little bit about what the pandemic pressed us to realize early on as it related to real world evidence. And then how did that lead to the evidence accelerator? No. I, I think I'm back. Am I back for you yes. too? Yes. Yes. Now we can hear you. Now we can hear you. And I don't have any children. On <laughs> <the internet. laughs> 
I think there's just gremlins around as well. So not to you know, I, I think it's all, all the kids going to school. We we uh, we've seen. So um, I'll start, and and then M Michelle, like, make sure that that uh, you bring me back to in, any parts of the question I, I somewhere missed along the way. Um, so. Inter March and COVID-19, where we realized we had a massive number of questions to answer and a new data infrastructure from which we could draw electronic health record data, electronic health record data married with claims data and other activities, but really not the pre preparations in place to figure out how we were going to leverage rural data and put it to task for COVID-19. We acknowledged that we were going to need to do that quickly while also maintaining a clear eye to the importance of getting the science right. So how do we make sure that the data are fit for purpose, that we know the right analyses and have the, the analyses fit for the purpose and the tasks at hand, and we understand the questions that can be answered with real world data in the context of COVID-19 and essentially the use cases. So in March, um, as FDA, we were really trying to figure out how are we going to do this work quickly. and looked to our partners in the Reagan Udall Foundation and Friends of Cancer Research. Congress mandated the Reagan Udall Foundation as the public-private partnership that sits next to the FDA as the foundation for the FDA. And Friends of Cancer Research stepped in with um, energy and experience um, similar to the real world evidence work that you've been hearing a a as a part of this overall meeting. And the idea of the evidence accelerator is to advance the work of real world data for COVID-19 by doing several things. First is to bring together a series of tools that real world data scientists and data holders can put to use to be able to do this work quickly. What are the questions to be answered? What are common data elements, translation tables, common protocols similar to what you've heard from Friends of Cancer Research, and then a forum to which people can quickly learn from each other. Another thing about the Evidence Accelerator was to acknowledge that there are many actors in this landscape that often don't get to come to the table, such as health tech companies who are curating data and may actually have data sources that can be leveraged for real world data in the context of COVID-19 if we give them the space to be able to bring the data and learn. And then also to acknowledge that in COVID-19, we need transparency and to learn from each other so we can do this quickly. And so we need, within the context of the Evidence Accelerator, to build the community where we're leaning on each other to build the methods together and do so quickly. This whole book of work um, has happened really in, in, as organized and put forward through Reagan Udall and Friends of Cancer Research. And as, as FDA, we're active participants and provide technical advice. But the other thing that happens is not only are we advancing the real world data science for COVID-19 and answering important questions, it provides us as the agency, as well as this larger real world data community, the opportunity to get familiar with these new data sets, with these sources, with methods that do and do not work in a way that is much quicker than the usual many year process that we would normally um, have encountered. Other questions you might have about that, I would love to answer, but I never heard the end of what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, please keep going because I, I think folks are really interested about how this access to different patient communities can be the engine for really accelerating how real world evidence is used internally. So, so let your creativity run wild. We're, we'd love to hear you think. <laughs> so so let's um, kind of think a little bit about the different kind of data sets um, that exist across the United States, even, e even globally. They represent di different underlying communities. They represent different um, care delivery patterns um, and, and certainly dis di different distributions of just people. So not only by race and gender and ethnicity, but also by the, the, the differences we all have in terms of our comorbidities and, and our health and, and you know, how we interact with the world. And so importantly, these different data sets interrogated in, in a consistent way, ultimately give us the chance to understand replication of findings, as well as what's divergent because of differences uh, about the underlying population. So one of the int interesting and exciting parts of the Evidence Accelerator is we've leveraged the Friends of Cancer mo research model of having single common protocols that many different data holders run, so, such as what we've been hearing about in this real world evidence meeting, but we've now done it 
in service of COVID-19 with all of these different data types across the country. First, answering the first critical question focused on hydroxychloroquine with multiple different data partners representing different parts of the country, different treatment patterns, et cetera. And then starting to take that same model and replicate it to answer questions related to remdesivir, questions related to corticosteroids. And we're also doing something similar to ask questions as it relates to COVID-19 diagnostic tests in serology and asking how do those tests perform and how can different data, data sets teach us about the performance of the tests as well as better understand the underlying population. One of the advantages of real-world data is generalizability. It's being able to have information that is reflective of broad populations and people who often don't get included in the traditional clinical trials. We'd ideally like to make sure our clinical trials are as inclusive as possible, but sometimes that's just not feasible. And so rural data helps us understand more generalizable and broader populations. And one of the things that's happening within the context of COVID-19 is we're first telling the natural history across many different broad, broad populations. And then we give, get the chance to understand what treatments are being given in those different settings and perhaps how those treatments perform or the safety of those treatments. And we can think about that for drugs or biologics. We can think about questions such as vaccines and certainly diagnostics. So that segues into my next question, which is kind of going towards the future and resourcing this work at FDA. The FDA user fee negotiations are now deeply underway and the last two rounds of user fees, particularly on the prescription drug side, have done a lot to advance real world evidence. Can you talk about how the role for real world data um, is going to evolve in this round of user fees and how that will transform what FDA can, can do? So I can't predict what's gonna happen specifically in this round of user fees, as you can guess, but I can kind of reflect on how we got here. And certainly um, prior um, user fee negotiations and user fees have helped to fund a robust program in the regulatory science and the policy development needed to build FDA's real world evidence strategy. And that actually, that strategy informs, I think, all of our real world evidence strategy. So I, I, I mentioned um, a few minutes ago about issues of data sets fit for purpose and, and the right use cases. And that lines up with the um, strategy or framework outlined by the Office of Medical Products in CEDAR, um, as well as uh, CBER was also a key participant in this and was published in September of 20, December of 2018, that was really the framework for real world evidence. And I, I think that's a really good example of the prior round of, of user fee negotiations, highlighting that in order to be able to confidently use real world evidence, we need to do the critical work of understanding and characterizing data sets and understanding when they're fit for purpose, of understanding and defining the methods and understanding when we can put methods to play in a fit for purpose way and understanding what use cases we can confidently use real world data. And, and that's really been a key book of work through Office of Medical Policy uh, over the last few years. Importantly, I think COVID-19 has accelerated some of that understanding, but it also highlights how much work we continue to need to do. Uh, and I think we're going to see uh, through the next round of user fee negotiations an extension of that work and also starting to, um, as we have guidances come out in 2021, start to see how we can now more effectively put that into play. Mm. So you touched upon this a few minutes ago, but I just want to circle back. The pandemic has brought so much attention to the disparities that have potentially been longstanding in health outcomes in the U.S. How's the FDA thinking about the impact of the pandemic on minorities and the use of real world evidence to address some of the challenges in drug development, particularly in having representative diversity in clinical trials? I think, you know, the, the pandemic has brought to you know, stark contrast many critical issues as we think about the care of all Americans and also how we make sure we understand the safety and effectiveness of our medical products for all Americans. 
Um, one example of how FDA has really worked to try and address this is by putting forth a COVID-19 specific guidance around diversity and clinical trials, really highlighting that it's important to recruit diverse groups of um, racial and ethnic minorities into the trials. But it's um, important that we also go deeper than just saying we should uh, you know, recruit diverse groups. We actually have to think carefully about ensuring clinical trials are open in settings where diverse mi minorities actually are also potentially can come into, come into trials. That we have ways of communicating about clinical trials that's accessible and helps people truly understand the role within um, their own personal health. So we've tried to put forward guidances. We've also acknowledged that there's still gonna be gaps in our understanding and this is a place where real world data can help to fill in those gaps. And so we look to, to real world data sets to be able to help us do that. But then we actually have to say, wait a second, our real world data sets have to be appropriately um, representative as well. And we have to make sure our real world data sets help us understand the, the details of the underlying population in a way that can help us understand inclusion. And so for that reason, our portfolio acti of activities isn't just bring patients into trials, but be thoughtful about where trials are open. And then when we're going to use other data sets to help complete the picture, make sure that we can do that in a way that is truly inclusive. Well, you know, it's interesting because what that calls to mind is I hear a lot from our member companies about how exclusion criteria to sometimes impact um, the diversity of clinical trials. You've touched on some very key aspects of improving diversity, how you communicate about the trial, making sure the trial is accessible and open and welcoming um, to diverse populations. But there's also been some talk through the years about how, you know, FDA directed exclusion criteria can inadvertently um, sometimes reduce the diversity in trials. Do you see real world evidence as a way to disprove the need for some of those um, exclusion criteria or to find another way to analyze the data so that you can have a more inclusive trial, inclusive of those with underlying heart disease or diabetes or obesity, for example? I'm just curious. So this is a really important question. And, 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 I, and I kind of think about it from a couple of different directions. So, so the first is that um, we have a program in model informed drug development where the general idea is to be able to use models to help more confidently design trials in collaboration with FDA and be able to look at questions such as appropriate design with eligibility and, and, and appropriate eligibility criteria and use data to do so. That's a formal program. Above and beyond that, real world data in many different ways can help us pressure test the implications of different eligibility criteria, as well as when there are narrow eligibility criteria, understand more generalizable information on the other side of the trial. So, so that's kind of like the other sort of part of the real world data story. So there's traditional model informed drug design. There's the role of real world data in essentially pressure testing as well as generalizability. And then I think we have a third responsibility and you saw this come out um, of our oncology center earlier this year of as we understand which eligibility criteria probably don't make sense anymore, we provide guidance that says, have you thought about, for example, enrolling older patients, enrolling the person with HIV. So that eligibility criteria that were historically quite restrictive, but really are unnecessarily so, are starting to be rethought. And I think the model informed drug design helps us get more confident in the building of those kind of guidances. That's very, very intriguing, very interesting. So you bring such an, a unique set of experiences to this role and you've seen the agency through such a unique period in history. I'm wondering what you see as the future of real world evidence and the challenges that FDA and the industry will have to tackle to get there. So as I think about the future of real world evidence, I, I, first of all, I don't think it's an either, either or scenario. I, I think that in order to um, really think about real world evidence, we shouldn't just see this as what I have 
called people thinking about it as the replacement product for clinical trials, but rather as a part of the totality of the story, the evidence story of how we understand a medical product, a healthcare intervention. And I think as an agency, as we continue down this pathway towards totality evidence, real world evidence will continue to have a larger and larger role in, in that understanding. We've been seeing that on the device side for a while, and I think we're gonna continue to see that play out more and more. Um, on uh, the medical product side, as we've as we've seen in the context of the pandemic, so th that's my first comment: is totality of the, uh, of the evidence. Second thing I would say about real world evidence is that as we move into a landscape of biologically targeted drugs with narrower and narrower indications, we're studying them and approving them in small populations. So that means we have less experience with generalizable populations and less longitudinal experience going into the approval of drugs. And one of the important things about real world evidence is it can help us tell the story as a long-term story. In, in, in gene therapies, we now have expectations around 15 years of monitoring um, for longitudinal evaluation. How can real world evidence help us with that story? So I think the second part of the real world evidence story that I, I would submit to you may be a part of our future is this ability to tell a fuller picture, especially as indications get smaller and smaller and trials are smaller and smaller. The third thing I would say, and kind of you, you brought up like, what would I see happen different? If we're going to continue to leverage world evidence, we're gonna pull these pieces together. We actually have to do this differently. We need all of the voices at the table. We need biopharma, we need um, regulators and academics and investigators but we also need tech companies and data companies and um, health systems, all who ultimately understand different sides of this problem and can come together to figure out how do we build high quality data sets that we can have confidence in? How do we do the right um, evaluation or what are the right methods? And then how do we do that at scale? Because we're gonna have to make sure that we scale. So that requires all partners at the table in a way that I think is gonna be important for the RWE story. So, you know, when I look out across our member companies and look at their concerns about FDA, they kind of fall into three buckets right now. And I'd love to get your reactions to them. The first is we see the agency under pressure like it's been under in no way previous to this. And so, you know, communicating about the science and scientific integrity of FDA and how robust it is, is a current challenge and one that will probably likely continue as vaccines for COVID get rolled out. So communicating to the public, and, and you're such a strong communicator for FDA, I'm wondering how you think about that challenge. The second is around getting the expertise. The science is evolving so quickly and the areas of science that FDA needs, as you just referenced in your comments, information technology, big data, is, is expanding so quickly that it's not necessarily easy for the agency to keep up with bringing that expertise in house and or accessing it externally. And then finally, it's maybe the esprit de corps question. You know, it's been such a heavy workload, such a, um, a demanding time for folks inside of FDA. How do we do what we can to support the bandwidth issue at FDA, making sure that you have the hands on deck that you need to get it done? So communication and um, scientific integrity, access to expertise, and bandwidth and energy and esprit de corps. I'd love to get your thoughts on those three buckets. And, and I know we're coming to the end of our time, so I'll, I'll hit this quickly, and I would love to talk to you about it more at any time in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so, so first of all, we have a crisis of confidence that we have to solve. Um, and it actually goes to the other two uh, buckets as well. And, and you know, the, one of the important ways to solve for that is through clear, effective, and consistent communication. And we need consistent communication that highlights the scientific integrity, and this is from experts, and also acknowledges that our recommendations are likely to keep changing as we learn, so that it's okay to have changing recommendations. That's actually a good thing, not a bad thing. So that one is really clear and consistent communication and a portfolio of communication that works. The second is this issue of talent. And importantly, we need to be able to bring on talent and you highlighted um, how you know, we need many different scientific experts. We also, and, and we're leveraging our cures authority and other ways to do that. We also have to make sure 
that people work kind of quote unquote at the top of their license, that we have people being able to do the science and be able to um, do the regulatory review and that we strip away as much of the tasks that can be automated through technology and other solutions so that we can really focus their time and energy on the work that matters most and that they enjoy the most to be do. To, to be do. The third thing is esprit de corps. So when you're working at the, at, at the top of what you do, when you work with pride, when you communicate with pride, you have esprit de corps. And I think that one of the things that's really important is that we continue to remember that the agency is built with career experts who are the best, the best in their field and do this as a public service and really take pride in the important work that they do. And I think it's really important that we continue to honor that. And I think that's part of esprit de corps. I love that. I love that. And it's an inspiring place to stop. So thank you so much, Amy, um, for that fantastic panel. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Michelle, uh, both for being here today and for your ongoing leadership. Uh, we really appreciate it. We have a great panel of experts uh, coming up um, that I'm going to turn things over to our moderator today, Kate Rawson from Provision Policy, to lead us through a subsequent discussion. Kate? Great. Well, thank you, Jeff. Um, I am very happy to moderate this fi final panel session on such an important topic. And I think our discussion is really going to be um, informed by what we just heard from Michelle and Amy. So let's get started. Um, we're going to take the next half hour or so to discuss the opportunities and, and recommendations for the use of, of real world evidence, um, including how uh, the FDA user fee reauthorization process could help facilitate the generation of this data to support clinical, develop, uh, clinical research and drug development. Um, so we'll really be building on the conversation that Michelle and Amy just had. I wanna just um, remind you all that there is a Q&A function on your screen at the bottom, uh, bottom right, and we will be monitoring that window and we'll get to those questions um, as we are able. But joining me in this discussion, are Adrian Cassidy, Global Head of RWE and Data Science at Novartis Pharmaceuticals, John Concato, uh, Deputy Director of the Office of Medical Policy Initiatives at FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, Mark McClellan, who is the Director of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy, and Mike um, Vasconcells, who is the Chief Medical Officer at Flatiron Health. So um, as they bring up there. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I want to welcome you all. And I'd like to start by um, asking everyone this initial question. And John, I'll, I'll start with you um, as our FDA uh, representative. What, in, in your opinion, has really been the greatest success or advancement of RWE in Padufa 6? And, and what should we do to build on that in this next round? And I know um, perhaps like Amy, you might not be able to talk about the second part of that question, but I'd love to, to hear your thoughts at least on, on, on the first part. Uh, thank you so much, Kate. Uh, I'm really pleased to be able to speak about uh, progress by FDA made during for 6 And I'll note that the commitments involved are aligned with the 21st Century Cures Act. So uh, prominent examples of FDA efforts include stakeholder engagement, such as hosting and participating in public meetings and workshops on RWE, as well as policy development activities, uh, such as setting up internal processes uh, related to real world evidence. And I should mention that senior FDA leadership is overseeing these and, and other RWE activities while they, while they occur. Uh, one important mechanism for such oversight is the Real World Evidence Subcommittee, uh, serving as a hub for RWE related efforts in the Center for Drugs and the Center for Biologics. Um, for example, the subcommittee provides an important forum for agency experts and a variety of stakeholders to meet, well, we used to meet pre-COVID, to meet uh, virtually now, to discuss initiatives or projects aimed at advancing the utility of RWD and RWE. The same subcommittee also serves as a very important resource for, re for review divisions when evaluating RWE proposals of which you know, we don't have decades of experience as with trials. So having a common forum for such discussions really helps to promote consistency in reviews as well as promote shared learning. Another category of activity, uh, FDA has been supporting demonstration projects focused on understanding data quality, improving RWE-related tools, 
and evaluating different approaches to study design and data analysis. Uh, guidance development, of course, must be mentioned in this context as a key priority, and we certainly intend to publish guidance documents in compliance with our statutory deadlines uh, in 21st century cures. Now, time is short. I can't describe all the activities, including some that are, are not directly related to Batupa, but the bottom line is that we see value in exploring all sources of data and evidence that can inform our understanding of the effectiveness and safety of medical products, as well as improve the efficiency of medical product development. Uh, your question actually asked me to identify one success. Here, I'm actually, uh, Amy Abernathy and I did not compare notes, but I would also point, as she did, to the 2018 Real World Evidence Framework. I just think that by providing a blueprint for our WA activities and policy development, hopefully uh, that's been uh, useful in the field as sort of a focal point. It's certainly a focal point internally uh, for real world evidence uh, regarding CDER and CBER uh, activities. So uh, last but not least, yes, as, as you asked about for 7, it would not be appropriate uh, for me to discuss any details at this time, as Dr. Abernathy said, but what we can say is FDA is certainly committed to continue to build the capacity for generating and analyzing RWE uh, to inform regulatory decisions about medical products across the life cycle. With that, I'll stop and say thank you again. Okay, great. Um, that was a great summary. And, and Mark, I'd like to turn it over to you. And, and um, you know, you've obviously been in this field in the, for a while, so we'd love to hear your, your thoughts. Well, thanks. Uh, th thanks very much, Kate. And I really appreciate uh, Friends of Cancer Research for doing so much in this area like they've done in others. You know, real world evidence is, is not new. It's been around in, in various forms. As you just heard from John, FDA does try to consider the totality of the evidence and, and most, if not all, of the things that they do. And looking back, um, you know, uh, I can remember the Sentinel Initiative being formed in 2007, which is now a, a big uh, enterprise for uh, uh, active surveillance, mainly on the safety side for uh, medical products. And more recently, been a number of applications, particularly in areas of cancer care, uh, thanks to leadership for the Center um, of uh, um, uh, Center of Excellence in Oncology, and uh, also in rare diseases that have applied um, uh, real-world data to other uses. But I think we are, as you've been hearing, heading into more widespread use of real-world data and real-world evidence, both for optimizing the efficient design and use of clinical trials, um, including hopefully getting us to more um, so-called real world uh, or, or practical trials where randomization can be built into normal data collection, doesn't require a whole separate infrastructure, uh, as well as applications um, outside of the clinical trial context and uh, where the data are not randomized and where there are understandable concerns. You know, I think um, when people were viewing these issues earlier on, they put a lot of emphasis on the, the lack of randomization and the importance of methods that accounted for the fact that people are getting treated differently may just be different for reasons that are hard to measure or maybe they're getting other treatments that go along with the one that you're interested in that could also bias some um, in the inferences about the treatment. But I think as um, this work has continued, we've seen the importance, just how important it is to understand the data. Healthcare data are incredibly complex. And um, Amy talked about this in the last session. She lived it in her prior um, experience um, in, in some of the pathbreaking work that, that Flatiron did and just really understanding provenance of data, uh, what different um, versions of reference um, ranges and, and different terminology uh, in, in healthcare data, which can be complicated, uh, actually means, and especially in areas like cancer, where you're worried about, you know, the size of the tumor and, uh, um, and, and response, and that can, that can be, a, uh, those data issues can be a real challenge. And, and that led to, uh, I think, that kind of experience, including the work that Friends has done, has helped contribute to that 2018 guidance that, that John mentioned. And that does lay out a, a really good general framework for approaching real world evidence. It puts uh, a big emphasis on whether the data are fit for purpose. Um, do you understand its properties, understand what's missing, understand where it came from, provenance and so forth. So you can really make a conclusion about whether it's accurately capturing what's needed for the application. 
as well as fitness for purpose of the methods. You know, you might like to do a randomized trial that is definitely not feasible in a, in a large range of circumstances, but we know a lot more about methods that can be applied to uh, get to results that can have more confidence. I'd point to the, um, the recently discussed um, Friends of Cancer Research uh, pilot, uh, looking at how well methods um, using real world data and real world um, uh, app uh, analyses could could uh, match up with the results in clinical trials. Uh, FDA's uh, piloted uh, or done demonstration projects that have led to some more insights there too. But looking ahead, I think we're quite not quite there yet. We're still a bit of the, as we discussed in preparing for the session, uh, uh, chicken and egg problem, where on the one hand, you've got companies that are really interested in doing more. You've got everybody, you know, people are paying attention to this. They know how much richer data are getting. They know how much richer uh, met methods for analyzing it are becoming with AI and other tools. Um, FDA has, has definitely opened the door and is following the, uh, if not exceeding some of the expectations from 21st century cures and engaging with industry and doing more uh, work in this area. But I think uh, looking ahead to PDUFA 7, as you were talking about, I'd like to see the next phase here take us into actual applications. Um, so more um, maybe pilot projects done in conjunction with industry, uh, not, not just academic projects, but, but real, you know, actual applications. I think the expectation should be on industry for this next round, if we really want to accelerate progress, maybe be a bit more transparent than they're used to being, you know, view this as a pre-competitive activity where in a number of key areas where there are questions about how real world evidence could be used for label expansion, for assistance with uh, trial design, for other regulatory purposes that really matter, um, to uh, be willing to share some of that experience so that others can get a better understanding of what guidances are really likely to mean in, in actual applications. And then on the FDA side, and this is where you need more uh, PDUFA resources, uh, maybe treat this something like um, uh, we did with Breakthrough or with other priorities. So the, the, the particular pilot applications themselves may not be you know, the most dramatic transformation of uh, evidence, but uh, if we're really opening up this whole area of work to another degree of relevance for, um, uh, for, for understanding the totality of the evidence, um, that seems like it's worth some, some resources being committed by industry or being part of a, a next round of 21st century cures to, to take us from understanding the framework, getting a lot more experience with the potential to really starting to do this on a, on a larger scale. Yeah, I love those comments about how um, PDUFA 7 could be used to take um, RWE to the next level. And, and Mike, I'd love to hear from your perspective as a, as a data vendor, what you think about that and, um, and what you think, um, what, you know, how, what we can do in this next round of, of user feeds talks, um, even though you don't have a direct seat at the table, you know, what we can accomplish in, in moving this forward. Sure. Thanks, Kate. It's great to be with you and the and the panel. And thanks to Friends of Cancer Research for 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 the opportunity. Um, I think I, at first I'd like to just underscore uh, Mark's comments in terms of thinking about how Bidufa Seven can might be structured in a way that that really is moving us to applications in a meaningful way. I'd like to add to that uh, a suggestion that we think about um, transparency in terms of the learnings that come from that, and um, uh, you know thinking about ways in which those learnings of uh, those applications or submissions generally can be captured and shared. Um, you know, how's the evidence being generated and, 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 and analyzed? How's it being used in the context of, of providing a totality of evidence by sponsors? How's FDA um, thinking about that in terms of decision making? Um, so I think uh, those takeaways, you know, in a, you know, in a, in a collective sense, really uh, will help uh, all of our understanding in terms of uh, how the data fits best. Um, we could think about that in terms of uh, summary basis of approvals for supplementary applications or aggregated uh, reports. Um, but I think, uh, I think that's an important uh, uh, consideration as, as we move forward. I also would like to circle back and, and underscore a comment that Amy made in the first session around um, propelling the collaborative research initiatives forward, perhaps in a in a you know an even more robust way than you know it's been very effective to date under Purdue Six and and uh, uh, I, I would uh, strongly advocate us uh, continuing to expand upon that. 
That's great. Um, Adrian, I want you to, uh, I want to make sure we get to you and, and hear your thoughts on this, on this question. Thanks, Kate. And uh, yeah, thanks also to friends for the opportunity to, to contribute to the panel. So I think maybe first of all, I, I just want to recognize, I guess, FDA in, in the context that they actually really deserve a lot of credit for the progressive approach to uh, real world evidence and medicines development. We can see that uh, many countries are, are now following FDA's lead in developing their own guidance. So, you know, I think that we've made uh, really tremendous progress in a relatively short period of time. Um, so for PDUFA 7, if I focus on, on what, what I think there, where I think there's an opportunity to build on the successes to date, um, you know, without repeating what was said previously, you know, just sort of the highlights for me, I think, is really around sort of ensuring that we sort of issue targeted uh, guidance that really builds on the lessons of PDUFA 6 and, and really providing more clarity on the circumstances where reward evidence is acceptable, as well as um, the, you know, the challenges that actually limit it, it, its use. So I think more clarity, more concrete sort of aspects there would be really helpful. Um, as Michael and Mark both said, I think, you know, having, um, being able to share the learnings more broadly, I think would be hugely helpful, um, really understanding both how the, the evidence is generated, as well as how FDA are using it to make decisions, um, would I think be hugely helpful for industry. And then I think lastly, you know, I want to sort of focus mostly on the point where I think that PDUFA 7 has really the, a, a great opportunity to actually establish new pathways to work with industry. Um, so, you know, I think the, the demonstration projects in PDUFA 6 were really highly relevant and innovative, um, but unfortunately there was actually quite limited involvement um, from the pharmaceutical industry itself. So I would personally like to see this sort of missing element addressed within PDUFA 7 and also the opportunity to sort of collectively partner uh, to develop pathways that enable um, patients to access effective therapies. Mm -hmm. Those are great points and uh, certainly sponsors need to be on board with this, um, as you mentioned, to, um, to make this successful. Um, Looking, you, uh, Adrian, you talked a little bit about um, the importance of regulatory guidance, um, and I wondered if you could just talk a little bit more specifically about what you would like to see in terms of guidance from both FDA, but also um, maybe from other regulatory agencies outside of the U.S. Right. Yeah, so thanks for the question, Kate. Uh, you know, I think that one of the aspects that's important is, you know, we're all learning together, and, and so it's really important to capture what works and what doesn't. Um, so that we can basically best leverage um, the learnings to, to help, you know, increase access to effective therapies, as well as understand the potential barriers to do so. I think the other aspect that's really important around guidance or efforts is really to continue to promote this learning healthcare system so that, you know, we have this opportunity to capture high quality data at the point of care. Um, you know, Given that the theme of the meeting is, is really um, around the international framework for reward evidence, I, I, I truly believe that there's always opportunities to improve collaboration and alignment between health authorities globally to, to probably actually develop more of a common framework that enables collective and more standard approaches to reward evidence rather, rather than having this sort of varying degrees of requirements for individual health authorities. Um, specifically on that, I think that reward evidence should increasingly be at the forefront of, of the International Council for Harmonization's work, mm -hmm. specifically in the ICH guidelines for good clinical practice, where, where some elements of real world evidence could already be incorporated. And, you know, I think that sort of just lastly finishing off, I think there's probably also a need for better consistency across agency review divisions, sort of recognizing that real world evidence is also it's highly complementary and sometimes essential in different disease settings and in patient populations. Yeah, no, those are those are important remarks, and I think you know consistency um, within FDA and and within all of our uh, global regulatory authorities is is certainly a theme that I know industry is um, uh, is concerned with and is talking about. Um, 
Mike, we know that, as I mentioned, that, that um, real world data vendors don't have a formal role at the PDUFA table during the negotiation process, but what, from, from your perspective, will advance opportunities for establishing development pathways for RWE studies? Yeah, thanks, Kate, for that question. You're, you're right, we don't have a, a formal role at PDUFA negotiations, but we've been partnering with all the stakeholders for a while, as have others. And, and what's clear is that we, um, you know, we have um, you know, an aligned perspective. And I think that's, that's fundamentally important. We have to keep in mind, right, that uh, in, in the United States, the vast majority of care is provided um, uh, you know, through, um, uh, through an approach that, uh, that, that's not gonna be represented in clinical trials. And I think all stakeholders, including patients, recognize that. So, I think as one of the architects of the infrastructure uh, to generate real world data and to support um, uh, uh, the evidence that can be derived from that, you know, we can help ensure that uh, PDUFA 7 programs are set up for success, that the goals are achievable, that um, we can uh, continue to work to identify and work through the obstacles we see and, and then support innovation. You know, our input, um, today comes primarily through comments and public meetings. But um, one thing I'd really like to advocate for is a pathway that thinks about um, the innovations that come from the partnership of life science partners with, um, with uh, data and, um, and digital uh, 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 companies that, uh, that partner carefully with them. And if we think about that, pathways that create scientific advice that is both uh, meaningful and, and timely and actionable uh, is something that um, we very much advocate. I think, I think digital um, uh, and uh, health tech companies certainly can align their perspective on that and then uh, advocate for the, 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 the right contribution to that scientific advice from within FDA across the, the medical and scientific re, uh, reviewers that are, that are most meaningful to help in, in, inform that. So that's certainly one pathway that we're um, eager to, to support. That's great. Um, we are getting uh, one question in from the Q&A box, just about metrics. Um, and so Mark, I'm hoping maybe you can talk a little bit about this. The, maybe the opportunities that might exist to establish best practices or, or metrics for evaluating um, real world evidence studies in, in PDUFA? You know, I think we're, we're getting there um, with the, the developments in the framework and with some of the early applications that we've just been talking about. But I would just um, reinforce that, that PDUFA, which is industry coming together, um, and also FDA leadership, which can galvanize action as well, is a great combination for um, getting that, that shared action. So um, we saw some PDUFA goals and 21st century cure goals related to real world evidence uh, this time around that have worked, uh, like the, the framework that's out. And, um, and uh, um, we heard from uh, John about some more guidance that's coming in line with those expectations. Um, I could see something that relates to key pilot areas, either with individual companies and individual products that are willing to do some data sharing and transparencies we've just heard about, or maybe taking on a few different um, areas of uh, therapeutic development. Uh, FDA plus backing from PDUFA for those kinds of activities, I think could really um, combine getting some of these pilots activities done uh, and um, getting a, a, a real commitment to, to sharing the data. And just to wrap up, uh, I know we're about out of time, but I wouldn't stop there. Um, it's not just FDA that, that hears about this knowledge and the clinicians that, that work uh, um, uh, with, um, based off the FDA labels and evidence, but, but payers, the broader clinical community, uh, CMS has taken some recent steps, mainly on the device side to try to do more um, uh, rapid approval of products, but in conjunction with getting more evidence on this broader range of patients that's going to use them beyond what ever the population that studied for the initial approval is. So better infrastructure coming, maybe some opportunities even for collaboration with, uh, with payers and, and clinical groups uh, on the post-market side. I see a whole lot of potential here. Yeah, and you, you're the best person to talk about that, having headed both FDA and CMS. So you see that from, from a lot of different perspectives. John, um, Mark has talked a lot about, and, and we've talked a lot in our time here about 
um, pilot programs. And I'm wondering how uh, the collaborations like the RWE pilot has, has been helpful to the agency in, in informing regulatory decisions. Yes, so much can be said, Kate, but with an eye on time, I'll be yeah. uh, very brief. Uh, simply put, the RWE pilot and other collaboratives are just critical to advancing real world evidence. So a huge uh, thank you to Friends of Cancer Research and everyone involved with the pilots. Again, um, I'll just say that frameworks, guidance, developments, demonstration projects are all necessary, but not sufficient. So important advances really come from the pilot work and would otherwise need to be addressed in the future, which would delay overall progress in this space. So I don't have time to talk about any one project, I, I might not regardless, but the idea is that experiences gained obviously can be replicated or modified and shared. They're proven considerations for design, conduct, and interpretation of RWE studies from different data sources. So again, um, they're really invaluable, they're transparent, and uh, they're really low risk or virtually risk free. So the bottom line is that the return on investment from these pilot activities uh, is going to be considerable, if not unmeasurable. So uh, I think you get uh, uh, my feelings about it, my thoughts about it. Thank you. Absolutely, that's that's great. Um, we are short on time. I wanted to ask one last question, just to sum this up, and and hoping that um, you know we can um, just you know keep our our remarks short. But you know, I, I do want to think of head and um, and what what would be some of the the, the bit, maybe the biggest hurdle to advancing. Um, RWE in, in drug development and, and what should be the, the priorities and, um, and but really what what is the what could be a big stumbling block and and Mike I think I'll start with you on this one and then go to Adrian. Sure I'll uh, put three three areas of investment out there one uh, continue to invest in analytic methods uh, invest in AI approaches uh, as we build larger and more complex data sets and let's think about uh, where our data come from, especially in the context of um, EHRs. And as we move towards interoperability, think about the use of the data in totality and, and think about policies and incentives that will align uh, along both axes. Great. And Adrian, your thoughts? Oh, Adrian, you're on mute. There you sorry, go. sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, so just building maybe on what Mike was saying on the methods piece, I think maybe I, the focus I would like to have is really around the, probably more the cultural shift that's needed to actually build trust in the reliability and validity of, of real world evidence. And, and so I think it's, it's really important to build awareness and confidence using these concrete examples of how it supported decision making. So I would say that actually the biggest hurdle is, is around improving transparency to build trust in real-world evidence. And you know, one, one sort of uptake of, of that transparency is potentially to sort of enable decision makers to evaluate the quality of methods used and the applicability of the evidence around you know, making, uh, for instance, you know, the, the, the sort of registration of real-world evidence studies to ensure that they become more transparent. So I think that's probably the area that I would focus on on top of what, on top of what Mike is, is feeling. And I feel that actually building you know, this, this level of trust and changing the mindset is really fundamental for the broader use and acceptance of real world evidence. Yeah, that's great. Mark, your closing thoughts? I uh, don't have much to add to all the great stuff that's been said already. Hope we can all work together on this. One, I guess one point is that sometimes people view real world as some kind of uh, alternative or contrast to, to, I'm not sure what the right terminology is for the alternative, but a clinical trial, you know, done under controlled circumstances. Keep in mind that what we've just been hearing about today gets a lot to issues like understanding data and its provenance and what it means that if we could really address well, we'd be in a much better position to do cheaper, more reliable, more widespread clinical trials too. Uh, the more that we can rely on existing data systems rather than having to have a site manager come in and extract a whole bunch of data to get a study done. So uh, there are lots of synergies um, with uh, between real world and, and clinical uh, trial type work that I hope are just going to become much more aligned in the future. Yeah, understanding that is definitely a, a hurdle. We need to make sure we're all on the same page there. John, I'm gonna give you the last word before we wrap up. Uh, thank you. So various hurdles exist as we've heard. I would like to go back to basics. And I think Amy mentioned this and Mark mentioned it in his earlier comments. 
But I think it's important not to overlook what was in our 2018 framework. Uh, sponsors can ask themselves three basic questions to set a floor for sort of the quality of, of the effort. One is, are the data fit for the intended use? Second is, is the study design used to generate the RWE? Is it going to provide adequate scientific evidence to answer or help answer the regulatory question? And third, does the study conduct meet FDA regulatory requirements? So it seems simple, but actually the devil's in the details of being honest and thorough in applying them up front. That would do everyone uh, a service in terms of improving, again, the, the overall uh, quality. Uh, so the time doesn't allow to go into details. I would just say the, this focus on methods that I'm bringing up is just one example of how we can move the ball forward regarding real world data and real world evidence. And more generally, and a huge thanks to Friends of Cancer Research for today and for all they do, but we need to think about anywhere value added can be found for all stakeholders, including sponsors, and ultimately the patients that we're all here trying to serve. So with that, I'll say thank you so much, State and, and Friends of Cancer Research and co-panelists. That's great. That's a great way to end. Um, thank you all so much for being part of this conversation. And uh, Jeff and Friends, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you so much, Kate. And thanks to all of our participants in today's meeting for being so thoughtful and forward-leaning in your remarks and for, for joining us. Over the past two days, a large body of work has been summarized by all of our data partners, and we're really grateful for those efforts. The presentations themselves will be available online, as is the white paper that was distributed prior to the meeting yesterday to learn more about their analyses. And please keep an eye out for the additional analyses that are already underway for publication of these results. This project has truly been a collaboration of all sectors, and we look forward to continued public dialogue on the use of real-world evidence in drug development. For Friends of Cancer Research, please join us one week from today, the evening of September 29th, for our annual Cancer Leadership Reception. While this is typically an in-person gathering to support the work of Friends throughout the year, this year as a virtual event, we have the chance to hear from leaders that are leading the fight against COVID-19, including Tony Fauci, Francis Collins, Stephen Hahn, Dr. McClellan will be joining us alongside Janet Woodcock and Peter Marks. And more information is available on our website and we hope that you'll join us then. Thanks very much for joining the meeting and take care.